Okay, so today I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome to the podcast, David Bird. Um, David is a transformative coach and hypnotherapist who guides his clients on a journey of self-exploration, self-realization and self-transformation, helping them smash the shit out of anxiety, stress, depression and overthinking and learning how to create a calmer headspace and become more of the bright, shining light of authenticity that they truly are. So David, today we're going to be talking about the addictive personality. And I know that you've told me before that you have a history of addiction yourself. Can you tell us a bit about about that and how you overcame it? Great question. It's funny because when I think about it now, like I don't, I don't think about myself as having, having an addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, But I always used to say like, I feel like I've got an addictive personality. But this kind of is, you know, I think this is what sparked the conversation that we're having now, right? Yeah. And um, so I think like when I was when I was younger, I noticed I could be quite obsessive about certain things. Like I'd get an idea about something and then that was my thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, that's why I thought like it was a personality thing. Um, but where it became a problem for me was kind of in my in my mid 20s when I started drinking. When I started like I, I took a I took a break from drinking. Like I, I started drinking, like I guess, a lot of a lot of teenagers in this country when I was 16 17 and i went to a house party and i basically i drank so much i blacked out and it really quite scared me so i took a break for a few years um and then i started drinking again but then what i found was well it it just it seemed to help me it seemed to help me kind of connect with my friends and Mm -hmm. and to uh well to worry less basically it seemed to make it seemed to have me like get, get me to have more fun right basically and um and so, yeah, it was almost like drink and fun, drink and friends go together. Like it allowed me to like spend more time um, telling my friends I love them, essentially. Oh, okay. uh, I feel okay about that. So, and, and in a way you could say, well, that was, that's a harmless thing, apart from all the money that I was spending on it and the, and the week, writing off the weekends, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but what then happened, I got, in, I got into a relationship and... And things kind of they started to not go very well right and i moved i moved out and was then on my own a lot and i and at the time i felt i felt quite stuck i felt quite stuck yeah. with the whole thing so um what i ended up doing was being like well how do i how do i feel good normally and of course my brain went oh have a drink that's how you normally feel good yeah what i didn't realize at the time was there's a difference between having a drink in the pub with your mates and having a drink on your own in front of the TV, <laughs> yes, <laughs> hoping to feel better, right? But that was the only um, that was the only, that just seemed to make sense to me at the time. Yeah. But then I got in this pattern of of uh, getting drunk at home on my own, waking up hungover, feeling shit, going to work, coming back, feeling shit about the situation that I was in, and then I'd be like, oh, I'll just have a drink to kind of to feel better. And that went on and on and on, right? Basically. And then, um, and then it got to the point, basically, I made some pretty bad decisions whilst mm-hmm. drinking, which kind of scared me into thinking, fuck, I need to really do something about this. So I did. And, and, I, and I was able to quit. But what it highlighted to me when I quit was, I remember, I remember really vividly actually going out. Because um, initially I sort of, I quit and then I, I didn't really want to be around. I didn't really want to go out. And I was like, well, I can't, like, I can't. I can't just sit around at home and, and not go out because I'm going to be miserable and on my own. I've done this before, but not drinking mm-hmm. is going to be fucking terrible. So I went, I went out and I remember, like I said, vividly being in the pub and almost having like a, I didn't have a full on panic attack, but I had this real panicked realization. that I'm stood there amongst all my friends. They're all drunk. I'm stone cold sober. And it's like mm-hmm. 10 o'clock in the, in the evening. So it's not really that late. Yeah. So I think we'd probably got there at six or something. And I suddenly realized I don't know any of my friends. Oh. I don't know what to say to them like I'm here and that's you know looking back what that was that was that was all the social anxiety stuff right that would had been the reason I drank before so that I could not worry about that and I could just get on and be in the moment yeah. but it was that it was that moment of panic of fuck um so that I mean in a, in a way that kind of led me then to look at well how do I deal with this and actually I kind of 
I, I found my way through it without really knowing what I was doing because it didn't seem like an option to me at that point to quit drinking. Uh, to, sorry, to go back to drinking, which is what I'd done in the past because of these mistakes I, was, I made. It was like, I can't, I can't be that person anymore, right? Yeah, sure. So that, but then I had to relearn how to be around people and how to integrate myself, um, well, yeah, socially. Yeah. Now, what, what, was, uh, what was interesting is it was fucking terrifying to begin with. But over time, actually, I became, I became the sober guy. And that was okay. So I kind of, mm-hmm. and I'd been that guy before, but f- for me, it was, it was not with those group of people. But actually, over mm-hmm. time then, sorry. So, again. sorry you, so it was with different people you'd been the sober guy. and uh, Yeah, yeah, because it was when I was younger, them. right? Yeah. And again, like I hadn't really, because like I said, I was kind of fumbling my way through it. So I didn't know, this is kind of looking back at it retrospectively. Yeah. But it got to the point where I was, um, like I said, I was accepted as the sober guy and people just assumed that, like, oh, well, you know, Buddy doesn't drink. And I remember being at, um, like there were points in the past where I'd be at house parties or I'd be out and people would be like, oh, you, know, you don't drink, you know, getting the stick from people as, mm. as can be a common thing. Or when you're not doing whatever the in crowd is doing or what everybody else does. But because I was the guy that turned up to the party with a mug of tea and just sat there and talked to everybody while they were doing whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, when, 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 uh, when like random people would turn up to the house parties or the after parties, if they would ask like, oh, you're not drinking. Like my friends would often jump to my defense, even if they were just asking quite politely. Mm-hmm. Which looking back, it, it was interesting to me because it's like, oh, well, obviously now I am like in their minds, like that's just me. Whereas yeah. before it was this sense of, oh, you know, I can't not drink because I'm going to get the stick for it and they're going to reject me and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the, that's the bare bones of it, I guess. That's the bare bones of it. It's an interesting yeah. story because I come across a lot of young men who find it really hard not to drink, even though they know that they need to stop. So it's interesting to hear your story. Yeah, it's good. So, well, can I ask you actually? What, what are they yeah. like? What do they say to you when they like? What are their reasons they give when they say it's hard to stop? What do they say to you? I think it's about feeling. Is that a feeling of rejection and and feeling that they're not good enough if they don't keep up with their mates? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, because as a woman, would be, I don't have that experience, and I I find it quite hard to relate to, but. I just, I just announced myself as I'm a bit of a lightweight. I only drink a half, I only drink a half pint. Don't buy me another round. Yeah, yeah. I'll get the first round, otherwise I don't buy any rounds at all. So, but it's much easier as a woman, I think. Well, for some of us anyway. But isn't that interesting? Because what I hear in what you're saying there is like, you're comfortable with that. Like you're comfortable. I'm a lightweight. I'm only going to have a half and that's okay. Yeah. Whereas if I, I've yeah. got this. I have to say though, I wasn't always like that. So. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm trying to. I don't remember that far back though, but I do. I used to drink more, and I drink less now because you just get out of the habit, don't you? And then you can't anymore. At least I can't. So I have to <laughs> well, work up know, to Christmas. <laughs> Would well, you know that was one of the reasons I quit? You know, I haven't. I haven't drunk now since last last February, and uh, yeah, last February, and I quit because me and my girlfriend at the time sort of agreed we were going to quit together. Right. But what really changed for me at that time so I kind of because I knew I'd quit in the past obviously so I knew it was possible but I'd got when I'd started drinking again because I'd started drinking again almost out of curiosity because I knew I'd quit out of fear and you know having done personal development trained to be a therapist and all that I was like doing shit out of fear is not a good way of Mm. like is avoidance yeah so I got curious and started drinking again and I had a much better relationship with alcohol but there would still, I found there were those points where, you know, once I get past that point, it's like all bets are off. It's like, fuck it, let's just get fucked. And yeah. And then the problem was my, you know, I'd feel fucking awful for two or three days. Yeah. But then, yeah, then it, it, I was in the habit of drinking it and drinking. And it's almost like, well, it is the weekend or it's a social function. I do that. And yeah, when me and my, when me and my ex decided to quit, then it Part of it was just, yeah, it was that intention and then going out and doing things differently again mm-hmm. and being like, oh, this is different, you know, learning how to be in that situation whilst not drinking. But what really sealed it for me was I went to a wedding reception. Mm-hmm. I was invited to go to a wedding reception in London. And it was obviously normally the kind of thing where it's like free bar, everyone's going to get drunk. Well, I went there and 
knowing I wasn't going to drink. And I spoke to a bunch of people I hadn't seen for ages, had some really good conversations. And even at the end of the night, the thing that sealed it for me was I looked at the dance floor early on in the night and I was like, no. And before, like, I remember being smashed out of my face and looking at the empty dance floor, being like, way, that's going to be fucking awesome. <laughs> okay. But of course, I looked at the empty dance floor and someone in me went, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the night, about like half an hour or 45 minutes or something before I left, I'm looking at this dance floor and there's more people on it. And I went, I'm going to get on there. I, I want to get on there. And I got on the dance floor and we had a great laugh. And then it was like, oh, it's time to leave. I've got to crash my train. See you guys later. And it was walking home where I thought, it, I just realized I was like, I don't, I don't need to drink for the reasons that I used to drink. Mm. And it was that realization. It was like, I could drink. But at that point, I was like, when I weigh up what I get out of drinking versus what the problems that I have from it, it's like, it just, I don't know, something switched in me. And at that point, I think I almost challenged myself. I made the test where I was like, whatever happens, I'm going to quit until, until Christmas and just see what happens. Yeah. And honestly, like since then, because I've just, I don't know, because I've had that in my mind, because I've then gone through everything, knowing I'm not going to drink, I've had to learn to be in that space as a not drinker. It's like, I just can't think of a reason to go back to it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually quite cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, David, earlier on you said that when you were younger, you thought you might have an addictive personality. Yeah. Can you explain what your understanding of an addictive personality is? And also, do you think you actually have one or were you mistaken? It's a good question. Um, I don't know is the, is the short answer because I still think about this kind of thing. Like, yeah. I've... You know, I've always jokingly said um, I'm a bit ADHD brain. I'm a little bit distractible, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know when I meet I meet some people who seem to be more like me, you know, they're a little bit like um, they can get really, oh, you know, it's like, you know, squirrel, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. And um, but is that a learned thing? Is that a genetic thing? In, like, I don't know. I don't know. But what I so I suppose what I what I question in my mind is is the addictive thing a learned thing or is that a kind of a personality trait if you like that gets hijacked by our bullshit mm -hmm. if that makes sense so something I, I realized as a um you know after doing a lot of learning about addiction and and, and reflecting on my experience was for me like addiction is really about um there's something outside of me that's got some magic power yeah so it's either something that can solve a problem for me that I can't solve without it. Mm -hmm. or it kind of, you know, it's a painkiller or it helps me avoid something. So for me, like, um, you know, when I was sat in my flat drinking, it was about, well, this helps me numb out and, 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 and avoid in a way the situation I don't think I can deal with. Yeah. But when I'm with my friends, it was, oh, well, this gives me this magic power of confidence so that I can smash the shit out of my social anxiety. Right. Yeah. But either way, it's this thing outside of me. Um, now, is that, and I suppose what I still am kind of trying to work out in my mind is I know I can get really excitable about things. And if I'm like really like, oh, I want to like learn something, I'm like, I don't just dip my toe in often. I'm like, give me five books on it and let me do three courses and let me. Now, I know some of that was hijacked by my sense of not being good enough in the past, where yeah, it's like, sure. you know, I'd see, I'd somebody have mentioned this book that I hadn't read or this course and, part of it was like, oh, I need to do that because then I'll be better. Then people will love me more, right? And I don't have so much of that anymore. Like I genuinely know like now I'm not good enough. Although I can, you know, I can still get fears and stuff come up because I'm not, I'm not superhuman, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have that, like I still can, something that sounds interesting to me, I'll be like, oh, and then I want to dive into it. Yeah. So I suppose, yeah, for me, it's, I'm still trying to work out where, where the line is, but you know, I often say to clients, I think it's, we can have these traits and these things, but our, you know, our bullshit can, can hijack it, if that makes sense. So I know that you talked before about having the sense of there being a monster or a bear behind you that you're running away from. So that would be like oh, yeah. social anxiety, wouldn't it? Or... Yeah, so the, the way I like to think about like that kind of thing is if someone's got a problem, for me, there's kind of two, there's two flavors of towards if you like, there's that mm -hmm. genuine, like heart desire, if you like, you know, like, I just, I just want it kind of yes. thing. Or that's a really good idea. But the other kind of towards motion is where there's a sense of urgency or a need, or you hear yeah. it in people's language where, you know, sometimes it's a should, but there's a pulling almost. And um, 
when that's going on, that says to me, that's not, that's often not a, a genuine towards. That's a towards because it gets me away from something that's behind yeah. me. Yeah. So the metaphor I'll use with people is like, um, you know, if they'll say like, I really need to do that, or I really, I really should do that. Or, you know, I, I, I just, I can't help but, you know, eat the cake or, you know, drink the drink or whatever. Yeah. The question I'll often ask is, well, what happens if you don't? Mm-hmm. How do you, you stop? Well, this is often why what, what that gets them to do metaphorically is it's it's like what I'll say, like if there's a imagine there's a bear chasing, yeah. chasing it. You don't see that there's the bear sometimes like consciously you might not know, but you're, you're running ahead. Yeah. So what the mind's doing is the mind's going, you know, go over when you get over there. Yeah. Like you'll be away from the bear. Yeah. So in a way, like it will project like what, like when you drink that drink or whatever, or when you eat that cake or when you finally reach that weight that you're lifting or whatever. Yeah. Then you'll be over where you need to be. And so they're often focused on on that. And then by asking someone, well, you know, what happens if you don't? It's like saying, well, what happens if you stop running? And yeah. that's what I'll often bring up. They'll go, well, the bear will eat me. Yeah. Obviously, I would, they won't ever say it's a bear, but if it's like, you know, for me, if it's like, well, what happens if I quit drinking? Now, I might not have known this at the beginning because I might have, I would have probably had a bunch of story about it. But when I quit drinking, what I realized was the fear was about, well, because I don't know how to socialize with people because I feel inadequate. Yeah. Because I feel I can't, I basically can't get out of my head. I can't stop thinking about, you know, saying something wrong and looking like an idiot. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. So then... So then it suggests that when they they finally say, okay, I'm prepared to face the bear, they discover there's nothing there. Well, what I often say to people is the the it's like the illusion for me is let's say they are somewhat aware of the bear. Because yeah. sometimes you get sometimes you'll get um you know, sometimes I'll get people to come come to me and it will be like uh they're a real stereotypical workaholic. Yeah. And in that metaphor, what they'll say is like, what I need you to do, I need you to help me get really, really, I need you to help me run faster and get better at jumping over logs. Yeah. And, and basically the conversation is, well, we could do that, but how about we sort the bear out? <laughs> <laughs> but they're not always aware, of, like consciously fully aware of the bear, because like I said, they're so focused on, I just need my strategy for dealing with the bear is the thing, right? Yeah. To run faster. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now I've gone off on a tangent and forgotten your question. What was your original question? <laughs> no, I'm not sure if I can even remember. It doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> I was like, I'll just do was... this little tangent and then I'll come back to it. And then I completely forgot why I, I think it was about what happens when they, when they stop running and actually turn around and face the bear. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so for me, what I'll have to, so the fear is, yeah, like if I stop, even if I stop to look at the bear, like it's going to get me. And this is what I'll say to people, like, I can't just, there's no point in me telling you, like, there's no, there's no bear, the bear's not real, because no, I'm sure course. people have told you that in the past. Yeah. But for me, it's about if you can get them to slow down and realize that this is the illusion, because the illusion for me, that's right, that's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. It's always when I get to over there, then, then I'll be safe, then I'll, then I'll reach that, whether it's good enough, or, you know, I'm, you know, connected enough, whatever it is, like, when I get to that distance, essentially it's i'll be free of the bear and then i'll be happy and i'll be okay yes but they often don't realize or they haven't consciously accepted the goalposts keep moving right however far i run run the bears behind me and i say therefore i need it's just it's the next hill i need to get to or the next tree or the next milestone or whatever so for me it's when getting someone to see that that's the kind of the game that's being played if you can get them to to stop and turn long enough to, to actually look at the bear, what they'll often find is, if not always, that it's not a bear. They'll see that the bear's got a zipper. It's and got that a zipper. Because it's a guy in a bear suit. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? Because it's like, it really looks like a fucking bear until you get close enough to it and go, oh shit, I've seen the zipper. Mm-hmm. And it's like at that moment, it doesn't make any sense to carry on running. No. But if until you've until you've had that kind of courage or that insight enough to stand and, and really take stock and see it for yourself, it's like someone else is going, don't worry, he's not that big. And you're like, it's a fucking bear. Have you seen his teeth? 
you keep running, right? Because it feels, re- it looks real. Yeah, absolutely. And a guy in a bear suit isn't half as scary as a real bear. Well, and it's like I say about, um, you know, I'll often use the example about Santa Claus with people. It's like once you, once you see for yourself he's not real, mm-hmm. like it doesn't make sense to write him a letter anymore. Yes. Because you know that's where yes. like presents don't come from then. But before then, while you know he's real, while you know he's real, yeah. if someone says to you, someone says to you, you can't write a letter this year, absolutely fucking distraught because you're like, I'm not going to get any presents. Oh, my God, no, give me the pen and paper. I need to mail it to him. Like absolute child trauma. Yes. Actually, I remember my daughter believed in Santa Claus and we lived in Belgium. And in Belgium, he doesn't come down the chimney. He comes in through your bedroom window. How creepy is that? She wouldn't sleep in her bedroom. So I don't want that man with a big beard coming in my room. I said, don't worry, darling. It's not true. It's just a lie parents tell the children. <laughs> right. Did it work or did she still believe? Did she think you were lying to her? No, she she then I think it took about half an hour to convince her that it was all made up. Isn't that but that's what I mean, right? It took yes. half an hour to convince her. Well, she was only about three years old, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's what but once as you say, once you know it's not true, you, you can't see it any other way anymore, can you? Because it's well once you know you know, once you've like I don't think, but once your parents have said to you, yeah, he's not real, you might go, yeah, okay, no. But then once they show you, look, it's our handwriting. Look, there's here are the presents that are in the wardrobe. Do you remember? Well, and they, yeah, you can do that as well. If you're... Well, it's stuff like that, right? Once, once you start, once, like reality will eventually prove the belief wrong, right? Yeah. You have to, and you have to work really hard after a while <laughs> to see that, <laughs> to try and keep that, uh, to keep the belief strong when it's, when it when it's completely contradictory to to reality yeah actually david so i was just thinking about because last when we talked talked in you know to prepare for this interview you brought up the concept of the double bind mm. does this fit in with the whole double bind thing well that assumes that i am could fully could fully explain the whole idea of the double bind because <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking about this and i was like uh-huh. um What's the, sorry, what's the question? So, you know, this whole thing, I mean, Jamie talks about there's a double bind and there's always something that's holding it in place. And if you take that something away, like showing the kid that the toys are in the wardrobe, yeah. then the whole thing collapses. There's nothing holding it up anymore. Yeah, Does, yeah. To, is that what you were thinking of when you were talking about it before? To me, it's, I suppose it's similar. So if I'm thinking about it in terms of um, my journey and addiction, I, because I, I briefly thought about this and, and then didn't think it through enough. So I'm going to, let's see if we can amble through it together. Go on then, that'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it would be like, if I'm, so I suppose in a way this would explain the yo-yoing. So maybe the, the double bind is not exactly fits in at the same, on the same plane. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's sort of like at a right angle to it. I don't okay. know. Hang on. Let me. <laughs> so what I'm thinking is, I used to go through this yo-yoing. Yeah. Which I think what Jamie talks about the double bind um, is what I've heard other people talk about in terms of the perfect self and the flawed self. Yeah. So the 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 flawed self is like I'm not good enough, and then the perfect self is, and because I'm not good enough, I then need to be perfect. Yes. But yes. neither of them are possible, right? Because if I'm not good enough, I feel like shit, so I want to get away from that, which is the avoidance thing. Yeah. But then I would get away from that by running towards being perfect. But of course, well, actually, that is the same thing, right? My monster is not good enough. And then my my end point to getting away from the monster is being perfect. But I can never actually be perfect because yeah. um, because perfection is impossible. Every, yeah. However far I get, it's never quite good enough. So then I end up going at some point, I go, fuck it. And you're back the other side again. And I go back. And um, what... um. For me, what the drink was, was so me socializing with my friends, the drink was the magic power to get me from flawed self to perfect self. Okay. Right. That was the, or that was what I imagined. And then when I was stuck in my flat feeling not good enough, actually what the drink was about was about numbing that sense of when I was stuck at the not good enough place of the flawed self, it was Mm -hmm. like, I can kill, I don't know how to get out of it, but I can drink so that I don't care about it for a bit. Yeah. 
Does that, that make sense? sense? It makes perfect sense. Okay. So yeah, so because for me, that's what I was talking about before for addiction. It's kind of, it's still always, it's something I need something outside of me. Like I don't have, have it within me to, to change this, yeah. but it's either, it gives me magic powers to get somewhere or do something <laughs> I can't do, or it somehow helps me to kill the pain or avoid something, which I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Yeah. And it's actually really outside in, isn't it? Because either way, it's something from the outside to address the problem. Because yeah. that's what I mean with my journey, what I didn't realise, even though I, I felt like I was kind of forced to do it within my, within my perceptual reality, like because of the decisions I'd made when I, was, when I was drinking, it was like, I cannot drink anymore. Now, obviously I could have done, but within what the world looked like to me, it's like, I can't drink. So in a way mm -hmm. I was kind of forced to face the dragon. It's like, well, I've got to, I've got to not drink. Yeah. But in doing that, I kind of proved myself wrong. I was like, oh, hang on a minute. So I can actually learn to socialize and be okay about myself around people because I, because I've, I've gone through that learning process. Now, you know, I, in the past, I felt like I didn't have to do that. Well, I didn't think it was possible, but also I didn't have to, because I could always just have a drink and make it go away. But because I was put in what seemed like that confinement, I then, like I said, I proved myself wrong. And you say you put in what seemed like a confinement. I mean, that again, is it's kind of constructed in your mind, isn't it? That, that kind of cage. Yeah, that's, that... that's why, I, that's why I, I, you know, I yeah. call it really addiction for me is about addictive thinking really it's about it's a yeah. perceptual thing like a lot of people will say a lot of the stigma around addiction is the drug is the problem or the thing is the problem like you've got alcohol yeah. addiction or you've got gambling like as if there's especially drugs and some drugs are addictive like cocaine like um uh well even no, even cocaine like cocaine for example it just hijacks the um the dopamine system yeah so yeah okay you can say, you can say that's addictive because we all like to have a dopamine hit yeah. um, or alcohol right because it because it will you know it will lower your inhibitions because it will quieten the mind a little bit but for example anybody who's anybody who feels good enough about um getting what they want and achieving stuff and being themselves doesn't necessarily get addicted to cocaine and anybody who's good at meditating and quieting their mind doesn't necessarily <laughs> need to drink yeah. right so it's really a for me it's really a perceptual thing like cigarettes for example they know you know they're physically addictive because the nicotine in them and actually when you're hooked into smoking a lot of the discomfort that's felt is the body going oh we need that nicotine but then again really that there's a whole perceptual piece there that gets tied in because of the story so the, what the person's really afraid of is i'll never be able to have another cigarette again or if it's tied in with you know i I need that cigarette because this is how I socialize. Mm, and it's the fear sure. of what happens if I quit? How will I cope? Like what will happen? What if I need a cigarette again and I can't have one? But then again, they're in that double bind thing again. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Playing, playing ping pong. But again, for me, it's all, it's all perceptual. It's all based on the world, the way I believe it looks. And for me, you know, I think even Jamie will say breaking the double bind pattern is basically seeing that it's bullshit. Yeah. It's seeing it's a game. And when you can get above it, it's like, oh, I don't have to do that anymore yeah but you, but you have and, to see it you can't just tell someone that <laughs> no you, they have to see it for themselves don't they that's the whole point about yeah. all of this yeah and, and i was just thinking there's that thing about in this moment i really want a cigarette and if i have one then i'm i'm going to be an addict again i mean this yeah. is my i'm thinking of somebody i know well but i'm not going to say who it is because i she might hear me <laughs> um <laughs> well she might not mind she heard but anyway keeping confidentiality so yeah so and and maybe you have a cigarette and maybe you think, oh, shit, I've done it. Now I'm going to be, and now I'm, and I'm hooked again. That's the damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? I'm yeah. stuck. I really want a cigarette. I'm afraid I can't cope without a cigarette. But if I have to have a cigarette, I'm a smoker again, and that's bad. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, <laughs> all we have is the present moment. And in that moment, you're either smoking or you're not. And is it you or is it Jamie says, well, do you sleep at night? Do you get to the night having a cigarette? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. It's the, it's, the, it's the story, the fear and the beliefs. It's all of that stuff that holds it in place, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, holding that double bind in place. And the double bind you said is all made up as well. Mm. God, life is all made it's up. Not, I found that it's not really great to just say, suggest to people when they're like... No. no <laughs> Have you considered that this is all in your head? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> um, so, is there anything else I wanted to... Oh, yeah, yeah, the whole thing about banter. Because you did mention banter. about using banter in the way you coach, and I'd love to hear a bit more about that, actually. Um, basically, um, 
I've just started being the long and the short of it is I've started being more more myself mm-hmm. and you know as you know about me I swear a lot I take the piss and um yeah. I can be quite what's the word I don't know um I do like to have banter with people and some of that is kind of you know it's that ribbing but not in a not in a um not in a nasty way no, so sure. there was a guy there's a guy called Frank Farrelly who you know God rest his soul he's not alive anymore mm-hmm. but he came up what what he termed provocative therapy now yeah. the, the thing I don't like that thing because like who wants to be provoked <laughs> <laughs> nobody like it's like the reason why they say don't poke the bear is because the bear like <laughs> the bear <laughs> freaks out and is not very happy about it yes. um and there are you know some people who get into provocative therapy like it doesn't go well for them and I've and I've made mistakes like this in the past because of not understanding it but for me the thing about provocative therapy is you've got to have the you got to have the rapport yeah like if you if you if you're working that way it's about like you know when you've got that um aunt or uncle who you know they love you mm-hmm. right and they can take the mickey out of you but it's not like it's it's with love yes like you know there's no malice in there and so it doesn't yeah. you know it doesn't make it doesn't belittle you it doesn't make you feel shit at all because you know it's done with love yeah that that's what Frank Farrelly was really trying to embody. And for me, what I found, and I've, and I've, I've made the mistake personally as well. Well, because th- this is basically how I used to act when I was a teenager and really insecure. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to have that banter without that okayness in myself and, you know, pure unconditional love for the other person, then you come across as an arsehole because you come across as, <laughs> um, well, you come across as belittling them and, and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, you know, and trying to take chunks out of them. But I think I don't know if it's Frank Farrelly that I think it is Frank Farrelly that said like really it's about you know if you're going to make a model out of it it's like you're not taking the piss out of the person you're taking the piss out of their behavior you know even if you take the piss but like a simple yeah a simple, of course go on well like a simple way that I would do like often like a client will say something to me I'll ask them a question and they'll give me what's obviously like some rationalization or story mm-hmm. and I'll listen to it and I'll just go fuck off but of course, like you laugh, right? And they laugh because they also, when I say that, I go fuck off. They laugh because they're like, "Oh yeah, that's bullshit." <laughs> yeah, but it's only but possible course, because you've got the rapport already. Precisely right. Because if yeah. someone's coming to me, like if someone's doing that, and I've got that rapport, I can have that banter with them because I'm going to sense that. But if I've got someone who's there and they're really into like themselves, and there's not that rapport, and they're talking about how, you know, and they're like, "I just, you know, I don't know whether I can." I don't know whether I can cope because, and you know, it's all about my childhood and because my mum did this. And, and I might be hearing this as a story, but I'm not going to go to them, fuck off. Because, no. like, well, they're going to think, well, they're going to think I'm a complete prick, right? Yes. Because I would be being a complete prick. It so that's be. not, I'm not going to do that to that person. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that, David. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose that's the difference for me, right? It's like, um, for me, if I've got, if I've got connection with someone, I can banter. And, you know, when you think about, um, for me, banter and like laughter, it's always been you. It's been used for centuries for to talk about taboos, mm, right? It's yeah. the thing we we make jokes about things that are that are uncomfortable, but it, yeah. there's there's a there's a tone to it or a flavour or a you know an angle, I guess, where it's like it's doing it with that love and in the right context at the right time, rather than coming across as belittling it. If that makes sense. No, it does make perfect sense actually. And there's that thing about helping somebody just kind of just step outside of that story they've just made up. Yeah. Even when it is about their childhood. Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes and it's like you know, they keep looking in the rearview mirror. It's like, for fuck's sake, look forward. Watch where you're going. Well, yeah, and like if the relationship I've got with someone is that it's more of that, um, you know, or it's that, I don't know, I suppose, um, sensitive type relationship, mm-hmm. then I'm going to approach that in that way. Whereas yeah. if it's that, if we've got that kind of banter between us, then I'll do it in a bantery way. Like it, 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 it just depends. And it, and it makes, and that's all about calibrating, isn't it? I mean, hundred percent entirely 100%. calibration. Mm. On which note, my calibration tells me it's time we wound up because we've run over the half hour, and people will, will stop listening, and and we'll be crossing. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, "You've been banging on too long." <laughs> <laughs> I've really enjoyed this. It's been brilliant. I no, really, think it's so something else to talk family. to you about sometime in the future because I like this so much. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I said I'm going to think about something else we could talk about in the future because I've enjoyed this a lot. It's been great. It's been so, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, 